The Process Podcast, breaking down the daily habits, processes, and tools of high achievers. Now, here's your host, Brad Wilson. Hey there, boys and girls. Welcome to The Process Podcast. This is your host, Brad Wilson. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to my show and rate it via Apple Podcasts or however the information is getting beamed into your brain. Uh, This is the easiest and most powerful thing that you can do to support my work and ensure that you get brand new episodes of The Process Podcast every single week for a very, very long time to come. This episode of The Process features Emily White. Emily sells out arenas. She's been on the cover of Billboard magazine. She's managed some of the most talented people in the music industry and also Olympians, just Super, super awesome person. She's an author, entrepreneur, executive, and champion of human rights. Quite simply, she's a force of nature. In our incredible and action-packed conversation, we discuss why sleep is her secret weapon to success, why she tries her best to cook and eat locally grown foods, even though uh, cooking is not one of her superpowers, how she would solve the gender pay imbalance if she was on a board with ultimate authority her hashtag i voted campaign that she started which hosts free concerts for voters and is spreading across the country like wildfire and much much more so sit back relax Uh, if you're driving or lifting weights don't relax too much and enjoy my conversation with emily white Good morning, Emily. How are we doing? I'm really well, Brad. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm I'm very excited about having this conversation with you. I've been looking forward to it. And the first thing that I want to ask you about is that while I was reading your book, it was very apparent to me that keeping a positive perspective is a very important thing to you. It served you very well throughout your career. Uh, Can you tell me Is that a natural skill? And secondly, could you tell me a story from your childhood that sort of helps us better understand the influences that have helped shape your worldview? You know, having a positive outlook and attitude and spirit and all that um, actually isn't a conscious thing. I'm originally from Wisconsin, and it's like the friendliest place on earth. Um, So I, I think it really boils down to being Midwestern. But I also think it has to do with being passionate about what you pursue. Um, As an entrepreneur, I create things in the world that I want to see. So I'm really excited about that. You know, other than what's the point of being negative, because you don't want to bum other people out, you want to keep them motivated and excited. Um, It's it's not really something that I consciously think about. And yeah, I don't know if I have any particular stories from my childhood, but my parents are super supportive. Like, I'm in my 30s and they just came to see me speak at the University of Wisconsin last week. Like, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because they've always been so supportive and amazing. But they're really busy and my father's an entrepreneur as well. So Midwestern home base uh, definitely contributes to both, you know, a positive spirit as well as, you know, that really stemming from my parents and my childhood. If you ever do feel negative, what steps do you take to sort of realign yourself? I think I'm pretty aware of, I don't want to say my emotions, but certainly my energy levels. Um, it's amazing how, you know, sometimes there's something on a Friday afternoon and I'm like, this is so hard, but I'm just aware of that. And then the weekend and I rest and I exercise and, you know, take a break from work, which is super important. And then when I work on that same thing Monday morning and complete it and it takes two seconds, I'm like, why was this so hard on Friday? So. I don't know if it's really like battling negativity more than just like being aware of one's energy levels and knowing when to stop and and take breaks and and refuel and re-energize in in the way that's best for you. I've read that you felt like you were sleep deprived until you were 25 years old uh, because you, like me, uh, require nine hours of sleep every single night. Mm -hmm. I, I know that a lot of people feel tired but they may right. not exactly have awareness of their energy level. 
how would you guide somebody into, you know, starting to develop that awareness? So when I was talking about energy levels, like sleep is a huge part of that, no doubt. But like on a Friday when I'm dragging, um, because I've prioritized my sleep, um, it's not due to sleep deprivation. It's just due to like, you know, working like crazy all week and being hyper-focused and expending a lot of energy. Um, but the sleep is really like a secret weapon. Um, it's interesting because I've, I've written or spoken about the fact that I sleep nine hours a night a few times that my social media explodes when that happens, like bigger than when I'm in Forbes or Fast Company or anything like that. And I mentioned this to a speaking agent friend who I consider to be really on top of trends. And I'm like, you know, I, I feel like wellness is a thing. Why are people freaking out about that? And like, we still live in a culture, you know, that just encourages like, just push, 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 work, work, work. Um, you know, sleep when you're dead. And that just, I, I realized that doesn't work for me. So uh, yeah, that's my number one health priority, sleep and sleeping nine hours a night um, over exercise and meditation, which are also major priorities for me. But um, yeah, the sleep just, uh, it, it fuels my mind in a way that, that is just crucial. It's so refreshing. Like I said, I need nine hours as well. I think a lot of people are under the impression that it's like a constant thing from person to person, but it's a very variable thing where some people need more than other people. You know, my grand grandfather, he, he worked 14 hours a day, five days a week. He slept four hours every night and just had endless energy. And when I, when I've tried to do that in my life, if I felt lazy for needing more sleep, I'm like half the human that that I am when I feel fully rested. What specific steps do you take for your your bedtime routine that ensures you do get peaceful, rejuvenating sleep? And I'm glad you brought up that the amount of sleep people need varies because also when you know, I've written or spoken about sleeping nine hours a night. People will, will respond and be like, I'm going to sleep nine hours a night too. And I'm like, no, like figure out, you know, what you need. I wish I was an eight hour or seven hour person. So it's absolutely all up to the individual. I try to go to bed as early as possible, uh, especially on weeknights. And at this point, uh, that's I ideally by like eight, because I like to get up at five, but usually closer to nine and, and getting up by six. And you know, when you get up earlier, you're able to kind of, I mean, there's, there's a million reasons why I do this, but your day does end a little bit earlier. So you start to wind down, start to relax. Um, I take one milligram of melatonin most nights. I smoke indica marijuana most nights. And if I really need it, I'll take some of that product z which is just the sleep aid element of uh, NyQuil. And I don't have any side effects from any of those. I mean, years ago, I played around with Ambien and stuff like that. And I would just wake up like complete, completely apathetic. But one or a combination of one milligram of melatonin and the marijuana and, you know, z or the generic brand for that um, does the trick. Very nice. I know that it, it takes incredible discipline to go to sleep at especially 6 p.m. I go to sleep at 10 p.m. And... Mm -hmm. I'm constantly, people are like, why? Like, what's, you know, that's crazy. Um, And I'm like, well, you know, I'm old and I like waking up relatively early. But Mm -hmm. going going to bed at six and waking up at three, what specifically do you spend your mornings doing? Because I know that that has to be a pretty sacred time for you. Yeah, that's not something I've done. I, I did a bit of that last year when I was running two major companies. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm quote, just running one company and, uh, we've started a nonprofit. So when I was running a startup as well, um, that was just the reality of the situation. So by getting up at three, 4 AM, I had complete quiet time for the most part. Our startup was international, but yeah, in general, just like from three to 6 AM, I was able to clear my inbox, get really on top of things and then go work out. And then have people, you know, kind of hit me with work throughout the day. So I I still like that process. But, you know, just running one company and also having uh, our nonprofit, I voted. um, That's been a little more sane. But it's it's still the same mentality. Because, you know, like, 
I don't always achieve it, but like I said, I, I like to go to bed at eight, wake up at five. That gives me an hour to read the New York Times, kind of get organized before I, I work out, you know, get some of the digital clutter removed and, and things like that. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very often for my inbox after working out by like 10 a.m. Um, and then I can kind of delve into Slack and Asana and some other projects and then also be in kind of responding mode uh, as things come in versus, you know, constantly being behind and playing catch up. How do you go about unplugging yourself at night and communicating to all the various people that are pulls on your attention that, look, I'm in bed at eight? You know, like anyone else, I like hang out with my boyfriend. I, you know, maybe get in a, a yoga class. Um, I'm Lately, I'm obsessed with the Milwaukee Brewers because they're really good for the first time in like decades. So yeah, I mean, the best way to not let people, you know, get your attention kind of past office hours is not to give it to them. At my company, Collective Entertainment, we have like pretty much rule number one is we respond to all messages within 24 business hours. So if someone sends something to me at night, and they also could be abroad, you know, I I would never feel the need to respond to that, nor should anyone that, you know, that works for me feel the need if, if I'm abroad or not, or send something in the middle of the night. So what's nice about the 24-hour business rule is if you do receive something at any time of day, you have... 24 business hours to get to it. So what that means is if I send an intern something at you know 4 p.m. Eastern on a Friday, they have until 4 p.m. Eastern on a Monday. Um, or if I, I I don't work weekends very often unless I have to at this point because selfishly that rest uh, makes me a better entrepreneur. But if I do, like I said, I I'm not expecting an assistant or co-manager or intern or anyone to get back to me um, within 24 business hours. So I think because of that. You know, with all the things I've done in my career, one thing, one of the things I'm most proud of, which is not like very exciting, is my reputation for reliability. Because people know that I'm always going to get back to them and also get back to them in a reasonable amount of time. No one's going to be freaking out if I don't respond to something at 10 o'clock at night. I think reliability is an awesome asset. I have people that I communicate with that are not reliable, and just how str- how much more stressful it makes. When, mm-hmm. when you don't know whether they're going to respond or not, um, versus when you're emailing or texting somebody and you know that they're going to get back to you. It, I think it's just a very thoughtful way to be. Very much commend you for that. I also love your policy for 24 hours. I, I know people personally who are salaried employees and feel like they have to make themselves open. 24 hours a day to all streams of texts and emails and stuff like that. And, and right. working just unimaginable hours. Yeah. What, what advice would you give them to, you know, have a discussion with their boss or the powers that be to, to, you know, get them some free time? I would say, you know, create that work-life balance yourself. See, you know, I, I feel like kind of what you're alluding to is oftentimes kind of, competition within one's company culture. So it's like if everybody else is constantly on their devices, then you feel a need to. But like, is that actually required? So first I would experiment, you know, and again, make sure you have that reputation for reliability. And let me also add the 24 hour business rule, sadly, is also there to slow people down. So I have a publicist friend that I mentioned this to over lunch and she's like, oh my gosh, I love that. Because, you know, she'll send out a press release or be pitching for clients. And every two hours, the client is emailing asking what has happened. And so she eventually puts a 24-hour business rule in her signature just to slow people down to point out like, hey, you're going to get a response from me. But just like, you know, sending me five emails in a day isn't, isn't going to facilitate that. Um, so I would say like try the work-life balance yourself. If you're able to you know, not look at your device or not look at your email or whatever. I mean, you could look at your device for fun things. Half the time, you know, run experiments because let's say that time is seven o'clock, which is not even, you know, really that, you know, we should all be done working at seven o'clock. But what you might notice is by the next morning, the emails that have come in have already been resolved. 
And not that like you needed to do something, but maybe it was a question that got answered or whatever. So I would first experiment with it with oneself because you may think these things are really important, but they're not. And you might be able to see that. But if it is something you could, you know, bring to your boss to say, it, 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 I mean, it's difficult, you know, because like I said, if, if the company culture is already there, that everybody's competing, and everybody wants to look good, it's just not a healthy situation. And you might want to look elsewhere because... Contrary to what my speaking agent uh, friend said, I do think wellness is is becoming more popular, and um, you know, and it's it's really important, generally speaking, for millennials as well. They they want that work life balance, you know, even for people that are super high achievers. I think self care is severely underrated, and you're right. Uh, if it is a cultural thing that maybe you don't have control of, then start looking around for a culture that is a better fit and, you know, serve, serves you better as a human being. And yeah. As counter, counterintuitive as it is, there's no debate that somebody like yourself that practices self-care has a structured daily routines is more productive than the person that's going to keep their phone on until 2 a.m. to get texts and then have to wake up at 7 to start going back to work again, they're just going to be tired. They're going to be overwhelmed. They're not going to be as productive and they're probably not going to produce the quality results that they otherwise would. Exactly. And that's why I hesitated. Like, I mean, definitely after you try experimenting yourself to see if it's like, oh, wow, what happens between eight and 10 o'clock at night isn't actually important and gets resolved by the morning. You know, the logical next step if that if that experiment isn't working would be to go to your boss. And I encourage people to do that. But I guess I hesitate because that company culture starts from the top down. Mm -hmm. So if your supervisor or boss doesn't understand that rest and breaks and things like that make you a better worker, I think it might be, that might be a hard mind to change, unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. I really love this advice that, that you give to the world. Do what you love that helps other people. Can you expand on that for me and give some actionable advice on how audience members can not only do what they love, but also work in ways where that give them the opportunity to help their fellow man at the same time? I'm kind of half millennial, half Gen X. You know, I come from one of the first generations and definitely one of the first generations of women that were told like, do what you love. You know, so when you're, when I was 13 years old, that was music. And nothing was going to stop me. There's no doubt in my mind. But I think a more holistic way to approach that advice, which I've you know, shared with friends who have kids and they've all responded really well, is do what you love that helps others. Because if you are in a position to do what you love, you're probably already in a privileged position. You know, the good news is I, you know, a lot of people think that way anyway. Do what you love that, that helps others. I don't come from a wealthy family, but I did grow up in a wealthy community in a very good public high school. And there was so much pressure already at such a young age to figure out what you wanted to do. So when that was intertwined with do what you love, music is what I love. And like I said, nothing would have stopped me. But I, I do wonder, you know, what would be different if if the second part of that advice that, you know, that also helps others was in there. I, you know, I don't think I'm justifying it to myself. Uh, I, I know I help our clients, um, but that's, that's business. But I, I do know that really supported and inspired uh, other managers, people on our team, interns, assistants, um, you know, met countless people through speaking engagements and, and things like that. So I'm trying to help in the way that I can, but unfortunately, you know, I was told, do what you love. So to a teenager, that's going to be, generally speaking, music or sports or video games or, or something like that. So if we can put a twist on that, um, you know, hopefully we can get kids to maybe think about how they can help others as well in their careers. I'm right there with you. And there's some symmetry between your love for music because I've always loved playing cards. As a 19-year-old, I got exposed to poker. You wrote a story in your book talking about when you were in high school and you talked about joining the music industry, somebody responded with, yeah, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. 
which has a 19 year old uh, saying, telling everybody that I wanted to be a professional poker player. I was met with a lot of right. the same, a lot of the same resistance. Poker back then wasn't as big a part of culture as it is now. This was back in mm-hmm. uh, 2003. I had coworkers laugh in my face when I told them that I was going to be a professional poker player. But like you said, when you love something, nothing's going to stop you. Nothing was going to stop you with music. Nothing was going to stop me with poker. And Mm -hmm. one of the big, biggest issues of fulfillment for me with poker was that I wasn't serving other people. And it's a struggle struggle that I've personally dealt with for a very long time. And it's probably what pushed me to start this podcast, to start my website, to do the things that I'm doing, because I, I believe that, you know, there's three, really three things that contribute to our, our happiness, having gratitude, being present and serving other people. And love it. That's just, I mean, that's a distillation of many books on happiness that I've read. Uh, but yeah, I, I love I love the attitude of serving other people. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's easier for me to comment on your experience with people laughing about being a professional po- poker player than, than my own. And when I hear that, I just feel like that's their own insecurities of like, they would love to be a professional poker player but they're too scared to try, you know? And so I, I'm sorry that you have that experience. And I just, I, I don't understand why anyone would react that way. when someone says, I want to do this. I mean, I, I remember being at an REM concert in like fifth or sixth grade at a big amphitheater in Milwaukee. And there were people standing on the side of the stage. Now, I don't think that people should get into the music or entertainment industry just for access, but at that young age, I thought like, you know, well, why do they get to stand there and watch the show from there? And I thought like, well, they're a person, I'm a person, I'm going to figure out, you know, how they got there. And whatever. So whether it's professional poker or any sort of dream, like you don't know until you're going to try. And if someone responds that way, you know, laughing or whatever, like I said, it, to, to me, whether they realize it or not, it could be subconscious. There's things that they would love to do that maybe they were too fearful to pursue. I agree. And don't feel sorry. (laughs) Don't, don't be sorry for me because it it had no effect on me. I was hell bent on pursuing that path. Yeah. And that was actually just fuel that made me want to do it even more and try harder because I knew it was something that could be done and whether or not people believed it could be done, I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I was just concerned with doing it myself. Right. And I would say if you're not doing this already, as far as helping others, I don't know how parents would feel about this because it is kind of gambling. But if you can like help teach kids poker, if you can start like after school programs, if you can bring it into like communities that wouldn't have access to that otherwise, um, I, I, you know, there's definitely things that kids can learn from poker as opposed to like negative things that they could be doing. So I'm I'm sure there's a lot of skills that that you've learned from that over the years that that you apply to your career. For sure. It's logic, problem solving, emotional, Mm -hmm. emotional control, emotional stability, being able to uh, make good decisions and have bad results and just move on. I think that's totally, that's something that a lot of people struggle with. They get upset because they do the right thing. They, they make really good decisions and then things don't turn out the way they expected them to. But Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all you can do is make the best decision in the present moment that you can and let the chips fall where they may. Exactly. In a quote uh, from simonsander.com, you mentioned that as a speaker at music conferences, uh, an area that you said has less sexism than other fields and still results in deeply imbalanced numbers, your panel consisted of 93% male and 7% female representation. If you had sort of ultimate authority on a board tasked with solving this problem, what are the specific actions you would take? Yeah, so what I was talking about there is I I have had the pleasure of speaking at like every major music conference in the world. And the music industry has its issues with gender, no doubt, especially in kind of like the technical elements. 
but really like it's an extremely progressive community. So as far as, you know, panels and boards and things like that, in my experience, and to be fair, I do come from kind of the more independent DIY side that might think about that a little bit more. Um, things tend to be a, little, a bit more balanced. And what I was talking about with the 93 to 7 ratio at a music conference uh, was a music conference I stumbled on where I've known the founders my entire career and knew them well enough to call them out on it and be like, guys, I see you have so many all-male panels. Like, I, I, I'm shocked by this. And I knew I could bring it to them because they were horrified when I pointed that out and they wanted to do better. So it's just creating opportunities. When we have a culture and countless fields, my God, law, entertainment, academia, I mean, even in quote, pink collar jobs, so like nursing and, and jobs that are traditionally held by women, men get paid more. So when you have a society where, you know, bosses are statistically male, you know, they're very often going to choose their counterparts. So just being more mindful, more aware, maybe not having an all white guy panel, um, you know, making sure that there are people of color, that there are women speaking, um, because all that does is it, it helps to support the next generation. And if we just want everything to remain the same, we could just keep doing it how we have. But yeah, I mean, for boards I put together, for panels, for my own podcast, we're launching an interning 101 podcast. I'm really mindful of making sure that, you know, women are well represented, that we have people of color represented, because that has just not been the case historically uh, in, in, all, in virtually all sectors of business. I, I'm with you. And unfortunately for me, uh, sort of shamefully so, uh, like I said, I've been a professional poker player. Um, this isn't something that I, I've put tons of thought into until recently because my mm -hmm. exposure to that is so minimal. Plus I am a white male. Um, but I have, you know, two young daughters. I, I have a wife. Nice. I, I think about it more and more. I was telling my wife the other day, like when I was in school, uh, I can remember who all the best students were. <laughs> they weren't the little boys. Right. Um, they were the yeah. little girls. The, the imbalance just doesn't make sense. And really, just as a society, I think we, we need to do a better job as far as taking action and action and, and balancing things out. You're exactly right. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of information coming out about girls being such good students and then kind of where does that go wrong? You know, where, you know, why are they not answering in class? Why are they not, you know, pursuing STEM? On a quote, smaller scale, what I can do is just be myself. And gender is not something I paid attention to really for most of my life. And I was a division one scholarship swimmer. My parents are swimming coaches. So I grew up on swim teams and you know, swimming is a unique sport where uh, the men and women train together. So my training partner was a guy and he was one of the best swimmers in the country. And I used to beat him down all the time in practice until he would notice and then he would beat me. Um, but my point is like, I think because of that, because I could beat the boys in school, gender didn't really cross my mind professionally. And sports and swimming gave me a lot of confidence and things like that. But I mentioned all that because when I started like interviewing interns and assistants and stuff about a decade ago um, for our management company, um, I was, I, you know, I would ask them like why they wanted to work with us. And, you know, 90% would say, I really want to work for a woman. And it's just not something I'd ever thought about before. But if we can provide that environment where, you know, young women do feel more comfortable for whatever reason, you know, they're an abuse victim, they grew up without a father. Any reasons that if, if if we can help them help them with that and also show that how respected I am by my male peers, how I interact with them, how I don't really see gender in my business feeling, hopefully that can help them to do whatever they want. So I think the best thing that we can do is support women and people of color, promote women and people of color, but also be that example and support system, you know, to help people get to where they want to go. As a father of two little girls, uh, I hope that things have changed by the time they start entering the workforce and entering the uh, the real world. Not to belabor this point too much, but like it's, it, I hope that too, right? Mm -hmm. But like, I think the reason I 
didn't see gender as a young adult is because we weren't really, it's, it's interesting because my mom is absolutely a feminist. Um, so she did educate me on a lot of these things. But at the same time, like, you know, we come from a generation that's like, again, do what you love, do whatever you want. It's not until you start to hit some of those glass ceilings, whether it's at my last job before I started my first company, um, there was a guy my age with my qualifications, and it came out over a drink to drink twice as much as me. Or, you know, certain situations where I'm, and, you know, I, I'm a professional speaker, um, certain situations and meetings where I'm literally not heard. You know, um, I was consulting on a, a conference and I was uh, one of four consultants. The other were middle-aged white guys, which is fine. But it came up like, how do we get to Wilco? How do we get to the band Wilco? And I was like, oh, I managed two of the guys in the band. But how do we get to Wilco? And I was like, what? Did you hear what I just said? So, you know, sometimes uh, you have to experience sexism is not getting heard or getting paid half, you know, someone who's equally qualified of you, qualified uh, as you to really be aware. So that, that's why I just, I wanted to harp on that one last time because I want things to be different when, you know, your girls are entering the workforce. But I think we all thought that would be the case when I was, I graduated from high school in 2000. So, and it's, and we still have a lot more work to do. Right. And harp as much as you want, because it's a very important thing. I want to take a moment to tell you about a thing I've created that's very near and dear to my heart. As anybody who knows me well knows, my wife is the single most important person in my world. And I feel so blessed and grateful to have many priceless, thoughtfully crafted gifts from my soulmate in my home that I wanted to create something that would become a similar treasure in your home. A Thoughtful Gift, Reflections on Our Love is a prompt-guided and illustrated love book that explores the past, present, and future of your relationship with your significant other. It's built to be an incredible date night experience that culminates in a tangible treasure that rests on your bookshelf for many years to come. To buy a Thoughtful Gift is an incredible wedding, birthday, anniversary, Valentine's, Christmas, or just because I want to have an awesome date night gift, visit mentallyinvincible.com slash a thoughtful gift. Also, as a free bonus, when you buy a thoughtful gift, you'll also receive a free guided meditation that's meant to be experienced with your person. I call it a butterfly meditation because when my wife and I did it ourselves, we both got butterflies in our stomach while visualizing our favorite memories together. Now, back to the show. I've read in your interviews that you're a big fan of cooking local foods. Uh, firstly, why locally grown foods? And uh, secondly, could you tell me about your process for cooking and meal prep while you're traveling for work? I am actually a whole cook. I suck at cooking. <laughs> um, but I am really obsessed with my cooking. Um, so I go to the farmer's market Every Saturday, and I think in New York City, so we have farmers markets every day if need be. You know, usually a farmers market once a week, pretty much. You know, and everywhere in the United States. So even when I travel, if it works out with the travel schedule and isn't too far away. I'll, I'll definitely seek it out. I'm obsessed with making local organic smoothies. I'm obsessed with local organic fresh eggs. Um, I usually buy as much produce as possible. Uh, make some rice. Make some stir fry for the week. That's kind of my lunch. I usually order order out, you know, go out or order in for dinner. Um, so I'm a terrible cook, but I'm very, very aware of what I'm putting into my body. And again, like selfishly, that's like for fuel, that's for energy. How does one feel when they fly across the country, let alone like, you know, lettuce? It's not psychosomatic. Um, I really do feel more energy from local food than, you know, if I buy a bag of spinach at the grocery store. That's the only thing that's available. I'm, I have immense gratitude that I have access to that, but I do feel the extra energy boost from eating uh, local foods as much as possible. Awesome. And I, I want to point out too, that I find that there's nothing selfish about self-care and wanting to have the highest mm -hmm. energy levels possible and feeling, feeling better all the time. You know, it's, it's a necessary part. It makes you better at everything you do. It makes you better at giving back to people. So yeah, yeah I think it's, it's just, 
it, pretty much a requirement. And in today's day and age, with the resources that we have, like you said, there's a local farmers market on every mark on every corner in every city. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's really no excuse to taking those steps to to practice self care. It's also usually cheaper if that motivates people as well. So I, you know, I'll get all this stuff and they'll be like four thirty, and I'm like, what? How is all this stuff four dollars or what? It's just amazing. I, I think it's mostly the friction. There are a lot of things that are way more convenient than driving to Definitely. the farmers market. Four years ago, I became a pescatarian, and that eliminated pretty much every fast food restaurant out there. Mm-hmm. For, for me. So that was like, it was a decision that I made consciously because uh, for one, I, you know, because I believe we are what we eat, eat. Um, so I, yep. I don't want to eat things that are pumped full of steroids, hormones, that sort of thing. Exactly. Um, so for, for healthy, health reasons, that, that was why I did that. But the side effect was that I cut out all the fast food. It, it limited, <laughs> limited a lot of my options, which mm-hmm. is Good thing. I'm obsessed with feeling as good as possible. And that's for better or for worse, its own addiction. But I'm really into just like maximizing my mind, having, you know, the most efficient energy possible, as opposed to repairing that from hangovers or not enough sleep or, or things like that. So it's, it's its own high, if that makes sense. Right. And in a sustainable and healthy way. I'll add. Exactly. Yeah. And if you can't do all these things, don't be too hard on yourself. But, you know, just take it one step at a time. One step at a time. And some of the extreme things we're talking about, you know, going to bed really early, getting up super early, doing all this stuff. It also might be nice to try if you have like a specific project you're working on, you know, or you're on a two week sprint or something like that. Because I completely understand how overwhelming this could be to a lot of people, but um, it's taken me years to get there. Um, but at the same time, it's definitely worth trying. It's like you're, like I said, you have a very specific project and goal you're trying to accomplish as opposed to being like, I'm going to change my life and do all these things. It's like, try it for a week and see how you feel. And, and speaking of, of first steps, uh, like you said, you're a former division one swimmer, <laughs> yoga lover, and daily fitness is something that you prioritize and just do on a, on a regular basis. Let's imagine there's somebody out there who doesn't have a daily fitness routine. What are some mm-hmm. a- actionable first steps they can take? Walking. Um, I know this is not quite what you asked, but I have a friend who, a friend from college who I've always known is overweight. And when he was about 30, the doctor said, yeah, your blood pressure is high. So I'm going to prescribe some, prescribe some blood pressure medication. And my friend was like, how about I just start working out? And the doctor like didn't really roll their eyes, but my friend was like, you know, the doctor's like, yeah, I heard that before. Mm -hmm. And my friend just started by walking. You know, I should find out what his process was, but I don't know if he walked a mile, built up to two miles, three miles. And by the time I came to visit him, like a year later or something, he was running. So he was up to run it, running about five miles a day. I have always been a terrible runner, which is very common for swimmers. And that's another story. Like we're not land. (laughs) Um, But I went for a run for him and I couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. And so he did all of that just by starting to walk. So don't even think about like running being a goal or something like that. Any of us can go for a 20 minute walk, build it up to a 30 minute walk, build it out to an hour walk or build it up to an hour walk. It's a great time to listen to podcasts, audiobooks music, clear your head. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's what I would encourage. You don't need to be like, you know, swimming miles in the pool by any means. In relation to the doctor rolling his eyes, you know, he's just going to work out more. We yeah. don't know if the doctor was a guy, so we shouldn't assume. <laughs> no, no. Uh, oh, I did say him. All good. What would be your advice on uh, implementing a system of accountability to make sure that those first steps can become a routine so that in a year you are running, you are doing more. Yeah. I think it's like, keep your goals simple. You know, like I said, don't be like, I'm going to go to farmer's market every week and I'm going to go to yoga every single day and I'm going to run a mile a day. That is why the vast majority of new year's resolutions fail. And it's not that we don't want people to achieve those things, but 
And, and I want people to strive for lofty goals, but you also have to like be realistic as far as like your schedule and your life and things like that. So the goal is just, I'm going to start by walking 20 minutes a day for a week, boost that up to 30 minutes next week. Awesome. And keep growing and evolving from there. It's actually very similar to being an entrepreneur because I think one thing that can happen is like, oh, you're not walking and like, you know, am I even getting anywhere? And the same thing happens as, as an entrepreneur. You know, you're working, 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 and just like, you know, you lift your head up at one point, and maybe it's just night or whatever, you're still working. And it's like, what am I even doing? And then I feel like you're like a animal, like burrowing through the ground or the snow or something. And you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, I've actually achieved all these things. So mm-hmm. you need to keep that in mind as far as like, I don't know what the goal like, you know, just integrating wellness into your life. So it's just like, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been walking and I just take a break and look back and realize like, oh, I've actually been doing this for three weeks. And I do feel a lot better. Like, yeah, I want to be running five miles a day. But it's just important to like, take a break, look back, realize what you've achieved. And don't be too hard on yourself, you know, when you can't achieve your goal for that day. Yeah, it's a perspective thing. Again, you know, it's looking down versus looking up. And I fall into the same trap of like, oh my God, I have 20 things to do today. And you feel like you're not doing enough. But if you really reflect and see what you have done, I think a lot of times you can see like, I am grateful that I I did get a lot accomplished. I I am doing things. I am making progress. Very important to keep your perspective right. Exactly. So what's a project that you're working on right now that's very near and dear to your heart that you would like to share with me and my audience? So I launched an initiative late last year along with Pat Santone from Wilco and the Autumn Defense. And it's called Hashtag I Voting. Uh, we've been activating uh, concert venues across the country to let fans in on November 6th, which is the United States National Election Day left hands in on election day who show a photo of themselves outside their polling place. Obviously, the goal is to galvanize voter turnout. And we're up to 45 venues in 23 states. Um, And our goal is to be in all 50 states by November. So that's been really fun, moving, inspiring, because the word has just been spreading like crazy. And it's really just been um, myself and our amazing intern, Zach, uh, helping with it. It's interesting as, a, as an entrepreneur because this is going really well because the idea is both simple and impactful. Whereas like when I've written new business models for streaming the music industry and intertwining downloads, that can go over people's heads sometimes. Whereas like this, they're like, yep, I want to get people to vote. Cool. How do I help? So it's awesome. So like I said, the word has really been spreading like crazy. Zach, my intern, has just been amazing. We're doing everything we can, you know, DIY this year. And then I want to show everyone, you know, what we've done and turn into a real, you know, turn into a real nonprofit. We've applied for nonprofit status, but that takes forever. But in the meantime, we're just activating as many venues, concert promoters, artists, managers, and agents as possible. It's an awesome idea. Very tangible, very simple, resonates with people. I'll have all the info on in, in the show notes and on the show page on my website about the uh, hashtag I voted campaign. Thank you. And when you came up with that idea, I, I love this quote that, you know, you said that the difference in Wisconsin was 22,000 votes and that's an arena and you know that you can sell out an arena. That feels like a superpower to me. Like, <laughs> could, could you... What like what is the process of selling out an arena? And actually, this may be like a super long question. So if you just want to distill it as much as possible. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a super long question or answer. And I guess I'm not saying like, I, Emily White, can just go stand on Madison Square Garden stage and people <laughs> will, will show up. It's certainly not that. Right, it's of course. It's that my background in the music industry in particular, uh, I have a very strong background in the live sector of the music industry. I started tour managing bands when I was in college. I did that from age 20 to 23. And, you know, obviously we still deal with touring and promoters and agents and things like that all the time as, as artist managers. But I'm forever grateful for a lot of reasons that um, my, you know, music industry mentor ended up being 
a guy named Mike Luba, who I should have mentioned is also a founder on iVoted. And Luba started his career as a promoter. Then he was an agent and a manager for a long time. And now he's a promoter at Forest Hills in uh, Queens and here in New York. One reason I have such a strong background in the live music industry, actually because of Luba and his world and, and things like that, he, he came out of, a, you know, still works a lot in like the jam band scene. And no matter what people think of that type of music, they sell a lot of tickets. So, you know, I was at the first, I don't know, 12 Bonnaroo's or something. I've been at every major music festival in the world. And so I guess like I deeply understand, I mean, I don't understand how the entire music industry works, but I deeply understand and have a lot of experience in the live music industry. So I think what I was thinking when I said that is like, why don't we just put together an awesome show at the Bradley Center in Milwaukee, which was our basketball arena, we're getting a new one, and put together just a concert and have people, you know, you can only get in with I Voted stickers. So this is about filling an arena. I'm connected enough that I know how to set up shows and do that. But then I realized I wanted to do like a Wisconsin Takes Action concert. But I realized if I took the concept national, it would have that, that much more impact. You know, without being too boring, uh, we quickly learned that uh, you can't give something away for voting. So you can't do the I Voted stickers. No one's ever gotten in trouble for it, but you have to make it available to everyone. So like some of us tried to do like three small coffees for I voted stickers and they got tapped on the shoulder and then just changed it to free small coffees for everyone on election day. So that's why our promotion is a photo of yourself outside your polling place because we feel that anyone can take a photo outside of like a school or a church or whatever. We're just hoping they walk the extra five steps into the building to vote. Um, not to mention, you know, the countless concert promoters, artists, managers, things like that, all pushing, you know, election day and reminding people to vote because, you know, the fact that our elections are on Tuesdays is voter suppression in and of itself. You know, without getting too into it, the last two elections I voted in, two elections ago, I went to work out in the morning and then I was like, oh, I'll just go vote. I go there and I realized I was not prepared to vote at all. I hadn't there was, it was a really long ballot and I hadn't researched the candidates. So I said, can I come back and vote? Because I didn't have my phone on me. And they were like, yeah. I didn't get back there until like 7.30 at night. And I control my own schedule. I don't have kids. And it was the same. Um, we had a local election here in New York last week. You know, I got up at five in the morning. I didn't get, you know, voting is a priority for me. And I didn't get over there till like four in the afternoon, which isn't super late. Um, but my point is like Tuesday is a super inconvenient time for every type of person, you know, for parents, for, you know, business people, whatever. So the more people we have pushing election day, the better. And then we also, you know, changed it to photos outside the polling place because we found out uh, not every precinct can afford I voted stickers. And also sometimes they run out. So we just wanted to make sure it's open to everyone. And don't get me started on the political system and voting, the electoral college. All yeah. of I'll just rant for hours and hours. Um, I hear you. How did it feel when that idea popped in your head for the I Voted campaign? I think as an entrepreneur, like I, I am a true entrepreneur in the sense that like, like I said, I, I put things in the world I want to see. I love my brain. I also wouldn't wish the entrepreneur's brain on anyone because like I have just an inherent need to create, to execute on these ideas. So I, but to answer your question, I, it's, it's energy and excitement is, is what you feel. And then, you know, you have to be just as much of a geek about like the work and the execution. And that's what's happening. Like, I'm, you know, Zach, our intern does, you know, constantly pitching venues. It's awesome when he gets one. I take it from there. Um, and the word just keeps spreading and people are coming to us. And national acts are coming on board. So yeah, it's just like, it's, it's a huge burst of energy, but it's also like, you know, you be, you continue to feel excitement while executing on the process. Because if it's just about coming up with ideas, I guess, I guess people have had this idea before. We're partners with an organization called Headcount that registers fans to vote at shows. They've been doing amazing work for like the past decade. And the executive director told me, like, people have definitely thought of what you're doing before, but you're the first one to actually do it. So right. we can all sit around and have ideas all day, but you have to be like, equally pumped about the execution. Yeah, I can 
it makes me excited thinking about you coming up with that idea, um, realizing you can, <laughs> you can execute it, implement it, take the take the regular steps and, and knowing like, holy crap, this is going to make an impact. Um, well, I think like it might sound like a cool or a lofty idea, but like the music industry is my second family. So I encourage people if they do want to get involved, just look around. You know, that could be as simple as canvassing. That could be, you know, registering every, making sure everyone you know is registered to vote, making sure they are going to vote. I registered two of my grandparents to vote uh, last year, not registered, but I helped them apply for their absentee ballots because, you know, they're too old to be able to go to the polls. Right. And there was actually a box where you can get absentee ballots sent to you forever. So just, just hope it, something that simple can make an impact. Um, it doesn't have to be the concert industry. That just happens to be my world that I know, and I know how to activate them. Maybe you could do the same in poker. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not telling you to do that, but my point is, like, look at your own communities and figure out what to do. And this is not related to, to voting, but as far as, like, I, I, I'm in a, a lot of podcast groups and stuff like that, and people are always wondering cool. about promotion. Um, promoting their podcast, getting people to listen to it. And one of the things that I thought was low hanging fruit is I just went through my phone, found all of my good friends and the people that love me and asked, you know, reached out and said, Hey, I'm going to start a text group. Whenever I release a new episode, would you mind if I sent you a text informing you? And that's, that's worked out super well. It, you know, it, it solves a lot of my problems. I don't have to keep, you know, telling people about things over and over and over again, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they, they can opt out if they don't want to be bugged. But I mean, like I said, they're my good friends. They love me. Uh, totally. Start, start with your inner, inner circle first, because those are exactly. the, the easiest people to rally. I love that. I've never heard of anyone doing that. So that's really smart. And obviously social media is a great driver as well, because it is called social quote networking for a reason. And that is your network, you know, so spread the word for sure. What's something that you see entrepreneurs wasting a lot of time on that doesn't give them much results? Overworking, like we talked about, you know, like I think if you want to push yourself to work those extra few hours, I would rather have, I don't really keep track of how many hours I work, but I'd rather have like six or eight amazing hours versus 10 or 12 of mediocre hours. So I think that's really, really important. And I don't want to discourage anyone from being an entrepreneur, but like I said, like there's a lot of, well, I didn't really do this, but like when I said, like I'm a true entrepreneur, what I'm trying to say is like, not to be negative, but there's a lot of wannabes out there. Like it's not about like the hoodie and the pink room table or even just raising money. You know, that could be, that's like a whole nother podcast conversation, but mm -hmm. I'm all about building businesses that are sustainable. The success shouldn't be like, we raised $10, $10 million dollars the success should be we made $10 million or, you know, this is how we're helping people. This is what we've done for our users and our community and things like that. Just make sure that your idea has impact and isn't just all about you and what you can get out of it and your investors can get out of it. I love it. So what software specifically do you use every single day in your own life? Obviously, still email. I I bring it up not to be like I'm so cumbersome, and I have other cool things that I'll talk about in a second. But I mentioned mm -hmm. email because it is such an important skill, and it's a skill that is not taught anywhere. Actually, um, every intern I've ever had doesn't know how to write an email because who are they emailing in college? Like maybe their professors, maybe their parents. Yeah, email. Um, my entire team is trained to be, you know, really efficient at email. We don't write long emails if it turns into a back and forth get on the phone we're big on moving people to bcc to spare their inbox things like that but obviously like slack has been a huge game changer um i think everyone that works with me at this point knows like do not if you're on my internal team do not email me unless you're forwarding me something and that's just the easiest way to get it to me or whatever and when we first started using slack uh an intern made an awesome point which was, I mean, obviously it reduces email volume because if I had to estimate, probably a third of most companies' email volume, like pre Slack, was internal. But the intern pointed out that it made the other emails, which is communicating with the outside world, um, it made those emails feel more important. So Slack is crucial, obviously, way more than just a messaging tool, but um, 
Yeah, there's one project I'm working on right now where I'm more talent, which is always weird because I'm a talent manager. Um, and I've kind of gently suggested like, hey, do you guys use Slack? Because there have been like a million emails <laughs> between the same you know, five or six people. Right. So yeah, Slack is just amazing for a lot of reasons. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just check it out. I mean, you know, at Collective Entertainment, we have different channels for each client, private groups if it's two or three people working on it and not everyone. So it's amazing. I still use, it's, it's a yoga term and a program. So I always mess up how to pronounce it. Asana, uh, asana. It's asana because asana would be the yoga term. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, I, I use that a lot. It's kind of more for like self project management, which is, I don't think what it was really intended for. Um, cause it, you can use it in collaboration, but yeah, I, I kind of use that for like longer term projects. I also use the reminder function in Slack a lot. So remind me tomorrow to email this person in or whatever. Um, that's nice instead of like emailing yourself stuff. As modern as the things I just said are, I'm also like behind, you know, like my business partner, Melissa Garcia is always sharing, you know, new programs and things like that. And, and they look amazing. The only reason I haven't moved in particular from Asana, I think that would be my next move, is I just, I have to move everything over. So I haven't really had like the brain space or the energy to do that. But yeah, those are, those are my main three tools for sure. Email, Slack, Asana. And I do most of my texting on my computer at this point. And sometimes like texting has gotten so out of control as another means of communication that people have had to get used to. Like I, unless it's urgent, I may only text you back in the morning because, you know, like throughout the day, suddenly it's like 10, 20, 30 texts. And it's like extremely distracting from what you're trying to accomplish. So I just usually respond on iMessage for text. And we won't get into Facebook message and, and everything else. I try to keep my company like pretty streamlined and professional which is something I had to teach like, one of my younger co-managers who was like doing a lot of work and communicating over Facebook Messenger. And I said, I totally get it because we work in a quote, like cool or fun industry. So like maybe you guys are talking about artists or a show that you saw that was so amazing. But at the same time, like you want to set the tone of professionalism and also copy in your co-managers. That's, that's how that came up because this, there's three managers on this artist and one of them was starting to like mention things that the other co-manager and I had no clue what he was talking about. And there was no bad intention, but we realized he had been communicating with other industry people on Facebook Messenger. So that's when we had to be like, move it over to email, not only because it professionalizes that relationship for you, but then, you know, the co-manager and I are in the loop. That's what CC is for. Right. You don't have to rehash it, spend more time. Exactly getting up to date. I, I did a, an interview with the, a guy named by the name of Marley Lunt, and he's a consultant. He saved Boeing, documented a billion dollars. And he's, wow. he's a big fan of whiteboards and visualization and mm-hmm. putting your process on a whiteboard. And his words, uh, he said, whiteboards have saved more time and energy in companies than apps and software ever will. What made me think of that was the simple thing you mentioned about setting reminders. Whenever you have things like you have a loop of things that you need to do regularly, uh, take you mm-hmm. know my, my podcast for instance. There's a certain process that I go through regularly when I'm getting a, an episode live and doing the editing and all of these things. But getting that out of your head, getting that into a visual place, when you set those reminders and, and you're diligent on keeping track of your calendar, you don't have to think mm-hmm. about them anymore. It frees up a lot of your time to be more productive. It doesn't uh, doesn't weigh you down. So I think that's just super beneficial for anybody out there. That- yeah, and not to mention that you know all these programs are built to assist us. Pull yourself away and yeah, look at the whiteboard. Like I always have a wide ruled notebook on me. Like in particular when I travel, and still use that for speeches and, and things like that. And I was surprised when our star intern at Collective Entertainment, who interns for us, interns at an agency, works at Inside the Actor Studio, and also is going to college, and she's amazing. Her calendar and planner is all handwritten and manual. But I think there's something to be said for that feeling of crossing things off, too. One of the major purposes of the whiteboard is a lot of people think we're really good at multitasking, but we're actually horrible at multitasking. 
we're just switching tasks. And every time you get interrupted by, hey, where are we at in this project? Hey, what are we doing in, in this? It can take yep. 10 to 15 minutes to get back to focus on what you are working on. So when you have that whiteboard in a visible place where people can just walk by and be like, oh, he's here, here, here. That, that right there can save you know, one to two hours of your day every single day. I love it. Do you have any books that you reread every few years? And which ones, if so? Not really, but my favorite book is, is uh, Walter Isaacson's Steve Jobs biography. Not because like, like <laughs> I'm obsessed with Steve Jobs, not because I'm supposed to be as an entrepreneur. I'm obsessed with Steve Jobs because I can relate. You know, when he was younger and would, you know, had such a bad reputation, that came out of like frustration. And I understand that frustration. Luckily, I have connected with team members and business partners that share that same frustration when people don't understand like, why don't you understand that this needs to be perfect? Or why don't you understand what this is going to be like on the receiving end for the user, you know, using this Apple product? You know, whether you are an entrepreneur or not, his life is just an amazing story. There's a few other books that I'd love to recommend, but but the Steve Jobs biography is amazing. So if there is one truth about life that you could convince my audience to understand, what would it be and why? You know, it's cliche, but just to enjoy the process. Every goal I've ever achieved from like a best time in swimming when I was a kid to like how well something like I Voted is going isn't about the payoff. It never has been. People have asked me my entire career, oh, your job's so cool. Or like, what's your favorite thing about your job? I get just as excited about the process of what I'm doing from the actual execution. Because once it actually happens, it's over. And then you have to create new goals and, and move on. So it's, it's really, like I said, it's like a, I think it's a Thoreau quote, life's a journey, not a destination. But, but that's true. You know, like my name was on the cover of Billboard when I was like 26 or something, which is, you know, the leading publication and in, in the field that the kid in high school like thought was a joke that I was pursuing. And I had this moment when that happened of like, well, now what? You know, because I, I, I realized like I had been like climbing a mountain in the music industry and I got to the summit, which I thought was the goal. And I look around and I'm like, well, there's nothing up here. But what was amazing and is amazing is the relationships that I've cultivated over the years and the artists that I've supported and all the things we've been able to make happen, like it really is about the process and the journey more so than the goal. Because once you get the goal, the best athletes in the world just reset their goals and go after something else. I spoke with a, an Olympian last, last week, Adam Creek, you know, Olympic champion. And in his book, he talked about sort of a depression that can come over yes. Olympic athletes once they get gold. And yep. it's now what? You know, he, he's a big proponent of setting goals post the Olympic process, regardless of what the, the outcome is, because unfortunately, you know, there are cases of Olympians who get depressed, who, you know, lay on the couch and eat food, but they just don't know what to do now. Expanding further, having, you know, expanding beyond your horizon and the immediate big goal that you're going to accomplish. What do you do after that is always a really good thing to think of so that you don't you know, you, you avoid that unhappiness that you can possibly feel. And let me just say, as someone who has a lot of experience working with Olympic athletes and elite athletes, and, you know, I'm very much in that world and the swimming community, community in particular, just know that there are resources out there because no matter what the level of sport, you could be the local high school star or whatever, that happens to everyone. And I know the USOC is certainly more aware of it um, at the Olympic level. And, and my client, Anthony Irvin, in particular, is, is doing a lot of work with the USOC on mental health. But just know that there are resources out there because it is messed up. Olympic gold medalist swimmer Allison Schmidt has, I mean, uh, quite a few Olympians have been open about this, but her story in particular, it's like, you know, she wins gold in London and then she has to like go back to college and be a regular kid. And it's just like, I, I can only imagine what a messed up experience it is where it's like, you achieved this ultimate thing that was your goal and everyone's goal and you are the best in the world and you're like 20 years old. 
it's like, right. okay, now what? You know? So just know that there's there's definitely great resources and help out there. What are those resources? Do you have them on the top of your head? Or if not, you can send them I, later. Yeah, I don't. But I just know that the USOC and, you know, other athletic organizations are starting to be more aware of that. And I think the younger we can be aware, the better. Because it's interesting. Like, I did think of one of the best books I've read this year, which isn't totally related to the question you asked, but is kind of related to this. And it's called Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. And it's by my client, Dave Zirin. Uh, I believe Martellus said it. I don't mean to get him confused with his brother, who's also an NFL player. But, you know, I had never read a book that really talks about what it's like to be a star high school football player in college. And I know that only 1% make the pros, but it's like, you know, when you flame out right after college and you were amazing enough to get like a, you know, to play at any level in college in such a competitive sport like football and suddenly you're 22 and told you're not good enough, man, that's going to mess with your head. So definitely in college, you know, look for those mental health services, both within the athletic department and at the university even at the high school level, and know that definitely at the, at the elite level, athletes and these organizations are definitely putting resources in to try to help you. Absolutely. And as related to the college athletes and, and, and football in particular, just take care of yourself. As far as learning and growing, furthering yourself, I hear so many stories about, unfortunately, with the world that we live in, college athletes can get treated differently and sort of mm-hmm. n- not have the same rigorous expectations, especially academically, that everybody else has. And then if you do flame out, if you t- rip your shred your knee up, then uh-huh. what? then what? What what do you do next? You know. So take care of yourself and make yourself a priority, so that you have something to do in the event that you're not a one percent person that that gets to be a professional. And then, then even if you are a professional, um, I think the average career span in the NFL is like two years or three years. Yeah. So I know I was on a panel at my high school with like quote successful alum. And there was an NFL player on the panel who played in the NFL for like six and a half years or seven years or something. And a kid like, you doing your short career in the NFL. And the player like immediately said what you just said, like, you know, the average career of an NFL player. And I just jumped in and I was like, I'm sorry, being a professional athlete for six and a half years is badass. I don't know if I can say ass in high school, but like, (laughs) it's true. That's amazing. One year is amazing. Like any time being a professional athlete is incredible. Emily, I've loved this conversation. I'm I'm very grateful for your time and energy. I know it's in limited supply, your time, your energy is maximized. (laughs) So where can my audience find you on the World Wide Web's? Sure. I'm at E.M. Wizzle, at M. Wizzle on Twitter. And from there, it links to I Voted, to our company, Collective Entertainment, and all our array of social media and all that. So at M. Wizzle on Twitter. Emily, thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. My pleasure.